I'm Carl Dix. I'm going to be the moderator of the panel that we have tonight, which is a, it's a very important panel, and I'll tell you why in a minute. I am a representative of the Revolutionary Communist Party, a follower of Bob Avakian, and an advocate for his new synthesis of communism. Uh, and like I said, I'm going to be the moderator. Tonight we have the co-author of the book. I was going to hold it up, but I realized that's bigger than <laughs> the one that I have, so you could see that better. Big Black Stand at Attica. And we have the person who wrote the uh, introduction for it, or forward, I forget which. Introduction. Danny Myers. Uh, Jared's work you see through the book, um, and maybe he could say, if, if he wants to say a little more when I introduce him, he can go and do that. Just about Danny, I've known him, do we want to <laughs> admit how long? <laughs> no, I've known Danny for like decades, yes. and uh, he was not only part of the legal team that fought the attacks that came down on the Attica brothers after the rebellion and was also involved in some of the offensive stuff that the Attica brothers did in the legal arena. And that's also an indication of Danny's life because he was someone who was always fighting for those subjected to injustice in the courtroom and outside the courtroom. You could see Danny on the streets in the struggle in addition to seeing him before the legal thing, the bar. I was going to say before the bar, but I didn't want to <laughs> confuse anyone. <laughs> so, and it's very fitting that we're doing this in Revolution Books. Because Revolution Books is a bookstore with books about the world and for a new world. It's the political, cultural, and intellectual center for a movement for an actual revolution. One to get rid of the system that is responsible for the atrocities being brought down on humanity, both historically and current day. And tonight's program will bring out a historical atrocity that this system perpetrated, but it's one that relates to the ones that are still going on. Some very directly, because the question of incarceration has intensified in the decades since Attica, and as well as many others. And Revolution Books' role is intensified. It's especially even more important because of today in the times. Because it's not only that the atrocities have continued and intensified, but that, as the revolutionary leader Bob Avakian says in his article, this is a rare time when revolution becomes possible and why that is so. This is a time when the factors necessary for making a revolution could be brought into being. And that underscores the importance of having a bookstore like this. So this is a place, if you're new to the store, come on back. Make it a regular in your goings about and around town. If you already follow the store, follow it more closely, support it. They have some needs coming off of the Hurricane Ida and some flooding that happened here. So they need the support to continue playing the kind of role that they need to play in a time like this. Because Attica, there's a, personally it means a whole lot to me. I was in Leavenworth Military Penitentiary when the Attica Rebellion erupted. And it was an important part of the journey to becoming a revolutionary, which I took the first steps back in the late 60s, early 70s, and I've been stepping on that path ever since. And it's, so Attica is very important to me in relation to that. 
And its important, its significance goes way beyond the personal. And that will come out as we go through the thing. So let's not be interrupted by cell phones. Uh, the bathroom is here off to my left. If you come through, try to get down under the, because we're filming this, perhaps to make some future use of it. And uh, I think that's about it. So I'm going to give you all over to Jared and Danny, who are going to talk about the book. There may be some reading from the book, maybe some discussion about Attica. Then there's going to be a brief period where I engage in some back and forth with the two of them. And then we're going to open it up to the audience participation. So that's how the night's going to go. Jared, Danny, take it away. Do you want to start with the introduction? Sure. Go ahead. Uh, Please. The most important introduction is saying that is saying that Jared is my stepson. <laughs> and this all happened because he is my stepson, I think, because he came to Buffalo to work on the damages cases in the 90s, in the mid-90s. And so we had the introduction to the Attica brothers and particularly Big Black, who had his case on trial. And parenthetically, or by the way, Big Black got a verdict from a Buffalo jury of $4 million. It was the largest single verdict in the history of the United States for a prisoner. All of it was taken away, and that's another story. So Jared has a very real introduction to Big Black, and they get along splendidly so well that they compose a book it's not published until after Black dies, unfortunately. Black hasn't seen this book. My, uh, I was asked to do an introduction, or I suggested that I do an introduction to this incredible book, this wonderful book. And I'll just read a couple of paragraphs because I think it sets the stage. Uh, this graphic novel is about real people and events. It is about a courageous, gentle person, a huge man with a booming voice. It is about people who were imprisoned at Attica, the maximum security penitentiary in upstate New York in 1971. It is about a rebellion for humane treatment. It is about the state's violent repression of the uprising that culminated in a bloody massacre. And as you probably know, 39 people were killed within six minutes on September 13th, 1971. And just, again, I'm sure you know, the massacre was ordered and choreographed by Nelson Rockefeller, the governor of the state of New York, who wanted to be president of the United States and this was his entree, of all things, to getting that position. Um, my involvement begins on the day of the uprising. Then I go to September 13, 1971, became one of the bloodiest days in modern United States history when New York State Governor Nelson Rockefeller ordered the violent retaking of Attica Prison. Troopers indiscriminately shot thousands of rounds of ammunition at unarmed people trapped within the prison walls, resulting in the deaths of 29 prisoners and 10 guards. After the shooting stopped, police beat and tortured the surviving prisoners. One of the worst atrocities was a sadistic barbarism perpetrated by state police and guards against Frank Big Black Smith, the central figure of this book. So I'll start by saying that it's an honor always to be on stage with Danny. 
he talks about 1997 when we were working in Buffalo and getting these incredible verdicts, these incredible victories for prisoners that had, were dying off at that point, almost 30 years later, 26 years later, right? And the settlement didn't go through until the year 2000. So really, basically, 30 years people had to hold on. And the juries came back with verdicts that were the most amazing verdicts that none of us could have ever imagined. And they were stolen. They were stolen by an appeals court. They were stolen by uh, a system that is tilted always against poor people, particularly poor people of color, black people. And, uh, but I want to say that Danny came into my life in 1975. So I've been with this story, and I knew Big Black from the time, and my brother, who's here today, Chris, uh, we knew Big Black from the time we were eight, seven years old, and he was a part of our family, as was his wife, Pearl, who still is. And Pearl is also a co-collaborator on this book uh, now. And we've been with this story for a long, long time. <laughs> and, uh, and it never, you know, you can see I'm tearing up right now, because any time that we bring it up, uh, it still hits you with the same impact. It hits you like a freight train. And the brothers that are still alive we're all in touch with and have been working with and interviewing for the Attica is All of Us uh, commemoration of the 50 years of Attica. And I want to truly thank Brother Carl for bringing us here and, and Brother Smitty who met me in Sorgates, New York, where we were doing a book signing at a beautiful place called Opus 40. And, and yes, <laughs> thank you, Smitty. And uh, he said, would you come down and, and do a, a, an event with Carl at, uh, at the Revolution? And I said, I would be honored. I would absolutely be honored. This would be an honor for us. And uh, here we are. Here we are. I'll, I'll just also then say, just so to give a little bit of history and background on the book, that when Big, Big Black was a person, and everyone will tell this story, all of his nieces and nephews, grandchildren, children, his wife, friends, everybody, Big Black was the type of guy that showed up outside your apartment building and said, I'm downstairs, go for a ride with me, and would take you for a car ride, and he would discuss anything and everything, but he loved talking about movies. He was a cineast. He knew movies. Surprisingly, he was a big fan of westerns, <laughs> which I was astounded to, to find out. And, uh, and so he saw his story. His story was a, an incredible oral history that went back to his mother, before his mother, who was a sharecropper. So one generation from slavery. And, he, and I want to add that Brother Carl brought up uh, being in Fort Leavenworth. Frank, and there's a story that didn't make it into the book that uh, we wanted to include as bonus material, where Frank did, was also in Fort Leavenworth. And his mother, Millie, took uh, a bus ride across the country to get there, to, to support her son in Fort Leavenworth prison, and demanded when she got there that she be allowed in. And they told her it was not visiting hours. She refused to leave. And the story, as it was told to me, was that the guards <laughs> came in to his cell and said, you got to come out here. We can't, we can't handle your mother. You got to come out here and talk to her, because she was insistent that she see her son after drive, uh, I don't know what the, uh, it was like a 12 hour, 13 hour bus ride, something, I, I, I can't remember the exact number, but, uh, but she showed up there and, and, uh, and was there for her son always, was there when he first got out of prison, um, 
so it's a story that that really covers it's an Ameri you know it's, it's a truly American story but, but an African American story that dates back to slavery and just to say that the brothers and part of the angle of the book was that they articulated it as a slave revolution that this was a slave revolution that they were extending uh, they were extending the, the, the spirit of abolition, the spirit of, of uh, resistance that dated back to slavery. And they used that language. Big Black articulated, articulated it that way. Of course, L.D. Barclay, Elliot Barclay, a very famous prisoner who was, uh, I believe, and I know Big Black believed, was assassinated, was targeted amongst others. Uh, and I'll just add this story because it, it is literary and I do want to give a little bit of, of, of space to the other brothers besides Big Black, that L.D. Barclay had written a book. He was getting out the next week. Uh, he was in his early 20s. And his mother came to meet him. He was going to be out in just a few days. And he said, take this book. I wrote this book in prison. So much like uh, the uh, history and, and legacy of George Jackson, uh, prison writers, um, he had written a book and he went to give it to his mother and she said, you're going to be home next week. They were always worried about things being confiscated. Come home next week and we'll have the book. And then of course, the rebellion took place, the massacre took place, and ev all of prisoners' property, by the way, was destroyed. All of it. All of it. Bulldozed. Flushed out of their rooms, their glasses, their dentures, their family photos, their letters, their journals, all destroyed. All destroyed. And the book by L.D. Barclay, which would really actually make a probably a wonderful story to imagine was destroyed so that's our story <laughs> we're sticking to okay. it okay yeah. <laughs> all right there are a few different angles i want to go to off of this let's start by talking a little bit more about this story because you made the point in your introduction, Danny, that the retaking was barbarous, it involved torture, and that there is no overstating in that. But let's give people a little bit the flavor of it, because I remember, well, first off, they stripped all of the prisoners that they didn't murder naked upon taking the place back. But then there was more to it. There was a gauntlet that was set up. And there was a thing about a football, which became part of the torture. And I guess I'd like you all to, to tell us a bit about that. I'll, I'll let Jared describe the torture. I, I can do it very well because I have been historically describing what I consider to be the worst of possible tortures of one human being or human beings against another and the fact that black comes out as sane as he does having sustained extraordinary torture. It's in the book, it can't not be in the book. Um, and it's the football under the chin, big black, was the coach, football coach of the prisoners at Attica. And after, and he was um, targeted for torture and brutality, and they devised the scheme where they would put a football under his chin while he's lying naked on a table like a ping pong table in D yard, the yard that was uh, subsumed by the troopers. And if that football came out from under his chin, he would be shot to death by two troopers 
with shotguns at each side of his head. And to encourage that, they began to burn him with cigarettes, with hot shotgun shells, and threatened him with castration. There was a trooper that had a sword at his testicles. This is going on. And if that football fell out of his chin, he would ha be castrated and slain. He holds how he does it, who would know, for four hours. He holds on for four hours until they allow him to get off the table. And he then runs what is called the gauntlet. It was a tunnel inside one of the uh, areas. On each side were correction officers and troopers with swords, with axe handles, with rifles, and you, everybody had to run the gauntlet. And, it was, and the floor was covered with glass. And again, if you fell, you'd get beaten to death. And everybody had to go through that gauntlet, including Black, who had probably no legs after four hours on a table. <laughs> How he could have possibly held himself up, he did. He goes into a cell. He's tortured in the cell. It just doesn't stop for him. And for me, the amazing part that is so horrible, it's unbelievable, is that he's a gentle person. He's, he never harms a soul. And um, he never went into prison for a, a violent act. It was a nonsense uh, arrest. He uh, stuck up a crap game on, the on one of the corners in Brooklyn and gets uh, 11 years, 12 years for that. So anyhow, this book that Jared co-authored with Black has all of this and has one other thing, and I'm going to turn it over to Jared, is what in fact was his life like after sustaining that kind of torture? And the main thing that it appears is nightmares. And that these nightmares took place every night with his wife. And that in the book, Pearl reports that he goes, that she finds him under their bed virtually every night in, in horror. So obviously it impacted him, but never with regard to his um, his interactions with people. <clears throat> so let, let me just fill in a couple of details too that uh, why he's saying how he had legs was lying on a table. They were making him lie with his legs over the side, spread eagle, naked. And we say that uh, the, 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 the um, image that the lawyers discussed in a strategy session while I was there was that it reminded them of Leonardo da Vinci's Vitruvian Man, the perfect man. And that became a metaphor uh, for Big Black. They also, uh, I, I want to add, they didn't just have him there torturing him like alone. They marched every prisoner before they ran the gauntlet naked, right in front of the table where Big Black was lying naked with the football under his neck, and taunted the prisoners saying, how do you like your chief of security now? How do you like your football coach now? You know, we're going to kill you all. And uh, Big Black, in terms of the torture, was put then in isolation, where both of his wrists were broken with batons. And they played shotgun roulette with him. They held a shotgun at his head and kept pulling the trigger, and kept pulling the trigger. Uh, the fact that this man was able to, and, and what a detail that Pearl actually gave in the book was that he 
They gave him no blanket. They put him on a mattress, no blanket, no pillow. And he had cut actually open the side of the mattress so that he could get some warmth. And that lasted for days. That lasted for days. They play, and they played shotgun roulette with all of the prisoners, always pointing in as they went by, went by, went by. And the level of humanity that he showed, even for the guards, especially for the guards, but the guards that even were involved when we were on trial, uh, for, he would sit there in the hallway and they'd be like, how you doing, Frank? You know? And he, the, the, the judge, which was a horrible judge, all of a sudden we're driving. Big Black, of course, is driving us all, like I told you. He always drove, always drove love to drive you places, love to do that. We're all of a sudden at, at, at a stoplight. And all of a sudden, the car taps us from behind. And we all turn around, and it's the judge from the case, and starts waving at us, like, hey. I mean, that's, how, that's the type of humanity that Big Black was still able to encompass and bring out in people. Uh, you know, there was no one like him. There will never be another person like him. And I, you know, I, he, I, he takes his place in the civil rights icon, and again, the rebellion icon. And, uh, and he was the face of prison rights for three decades. And, and he visited prisoners all over the country, certainly all over the state. And he was a rehabilitation uh, worker, drug counselor, counseled youth. And he never, ever lost his love of people. Never. He never lost his love of people. Wow. OK, I said earlier that Attica was part of my journey to becoming a revolutionary. But I also said it wasn't a personal thing. And look, Attica deepened and spread the spirit of rebellion and revolution that was widespread in the late 60s, early 70s. You know, because there were a lot, of, a lot of people who were already into revolution. And if that was you, when Attica erupted, it deepened that for you. But then there were people who weren't yet into revolution. Attica happens, and you hear L.D. Barclay speaking for the, it was about 1,300 prisoners? In 1,280. 1,280, yeah. 1,281. Okay, <laughs> see, there's the exact. <laughs> for those prisoners, L.D. Barclay standing up and saying, we are men. We are not animals. And we refuse to be driven as such. And these were the people who were supposed to be thrown away in society, the worst of the worst. And they were not only declaring their humanity, but standing up and fighting for it. That moved a lot of people who weren't yet to revolution. It moved them to revolution. That's why I say it both deepened and spread that spirit of rebellion and revolution back in the 1960s. And I will say again, that is a spirit that is even more needed today. And that's both because of the horrors that are being brought down. And if you want to say, well, what are you talking about, Carl Horrors? Taking away a woman's right to choose to have an abortion. Absolutely. While you're trying to take away the rights of people who fought for decades to gain the right to vote, now you're taking it back. Burning and flooding of the planet caused by a climate emergency, while one side of the ruling class denies that it's really happening, the other side acknowledges it but doesn't do shit that is at all capable of dealing with that emergency. That's what this system is doing 
to us today. And they're fighting over, and they're fighting at the top, but it's not like one side's fighting for the interest of the people and the other side's fighting against it. They're fighting over what's the best way to keep their system going. This is a time where there's not only horrors, but that fighting actually exposes the vulnerability of the system. And it's like I, I mentioned this piece from Bob Avakian, the revolutionary leader and author of The New Communism. This is a rare time when revolution becomes possible, and he gets into why that is so and how to seize on this rare opportunity. Into this kind of situation, with what's at stake, at stake both in terms of the positive and negative, the spirit of Attica becomes very, very important. That's why I thought this program was very important to do. It also happens that today is 58 years since the bombing of the church in Birmingham where the four young girls were murdered. And when you think about that, the kinds of people who did that bombing are also being unleashed today in society. Yep. You know, the, the grandchildren and great-grandchildren, politically and ideologically, not necessarily directly, you know, genealogically, but politically and ideologically, their grandchildren and great-grandchildren are being unleashed on society right now. This is a time when it's both necessary to act to stop this, but also possible because of the vulnerability and the weakness that gets exposed by this infighting. Uh, and I'd really encourage people to get these two pieces, the one, the rare time piece by Bob Avakian, but also the declaration and call to get organized for real revolution, because that's what we need. Uh, I'm going to ask one more thing. You guys can comment on what I just said, but I also wanted to raise, because this is another thing that really struck me about Attica at the time and ever since, because, you know, you're in prison and there's like a lot of divisions among the prisoners along the lines of race, different street organizations, uh, the black Muslims were a major part of it and they had beefs with other people. And then in Attica, these prisoners stand up together. Right. And I'm thinking to myself, and I was in solitary confinement at the time, I was in the hole. <laughs> so it wasn't like I was interacting with a lot of other prisoners. But I was thinking like if something like this had happened here, how would we deal with all those beefs? People in Attica did it. And I wondered if you guys could speak about that, including they dealt with the problem of revenge on the guards, because some people probably wanted to kill those guards. And there are people alive that that'll tell you that, that they wanted to, that so they were like talk ready about to that. fight. But uh, well, I, I want to let Dan answer because he. Well, the, the short of that is that there were 38, 40 hostages all of whom were protected by prisoners. And Big Black set the tone by having everybody unharmed that was in the yard. The state came into the yard to negotiate this rebellion. And that was obviously the hope that that would in fact happen. In order to ensure that no harm would come to anybody entering Attica from the state, including the Commissioner of Correction. He was sitting in there at the table uh, during the time of negotiations. Uh, the prisoners protected the guards, protected the hostages, protected the state officials, including the highest ranking official in corrections, the Commissioner of Corrections. Um, they did not expect, because they were this significantly attuned to the needs of others, including officials, they did not expect this massacre. As Jared said in his introduction, that blacks thought maybe they'd have their heads banged around and, and pushed around upon a retaking, uh, a non-negotiated retaking never expected this massacre. Um, and um, 
because they were not capable of massacring. They were a, a people that were human, not like the guards and not like the state troopers and not like especially Rockefeller, who believed in violence. And, uh, you know, it's, a tra it, it's certainly a tragedy, but it's also a way of saying, look at the way Big Black set up the defense inside the prison. Nobody got hurt. Nobody got disturbed. Everybody was able to do their business with an expectation that that would lead to a negotiated settlement, and it did not. Yeah. And <clears throat> also, uh, Big Black secured the release of injured guards, uh, including the only guard that did uh, die during the original taking of the prison when a gate fell on him. And Big Black led the detail to make sure that he got to safety. And they left him. They left this guy for hours. And he eventually died. And uh, Big Black was chosen, and I'm glad Brother Carl made the point, that uh, because there were all these other factions, the Young Lords, the Black Panthers, the Muslims, white prisoners from the Weather Underground, Sam Melville, uh, whose son Joshua just wrote a, a brilliant book uh, called The Mad Bomber. Um, I also want to mention, too, just quickly, because part of this book really is uh, our collaboration with Amezian, who is the artist, uh, who, yeah. <laughs> He's from Paris. And uh, I found his book, Muhammad Ali, in, uh, in a bookstore. And he wrote back to me instantly. I wrote to him. I said, I found your book. I'm working on this project. I want to collaborate with you. And he wrote me back, and he, and he, put that, he drew that drawing of Big Black. That was the first drawing he made. He sent it back to me that weekend and said, I'm your guy. I'm your guy. You, you're, you got the right guy. I'm ready for this. So, and I also want to add, because our creative consultant, Patrick Kennedy, is outside, <clears throat> who actually was the one that came to me, because I came to him in 2016 and said, I feel like I have to give this one more try. And uh, because, like I told you, Big Black was a big cineast, a fan of movies, we had envisioned it as a movie, of, you know, obviously. As is the case with most artists, when you're unknown, you couldn't get anybody to read it. People would say, it sounds like a great idea. I'll read it. Wouldn't read it. So I was, and so my friend Patrick said to me, I know you have your heart set on this being a movie, but consider doing it as a graphic novel. We can make a graphic novel ourselves, and even if we just do a Kickstarter, whatever we have to do to get it done, we can do that. We can't make a million dollar movie, but we can make a $30,000 book. And that's what we did, all of us together. And we all pulled together like the little team that could. And then the book took on a life of its own because of, because of Big Black. And, and I think that uh, Pearl says it, I say it. My mom, Joan, who of course was the one that brought Danny into our lives, um, says it, that you know the, the biggest regret we all have is that Frank wasn't here for the book because he would have loved this. He would have loved this. This was the type of thing he loved. And, uh, and so we always feel his presence, of course, and we say that he's the heartbeat of our project. But it's a collaboration of many people, and including the people at, at, at Boom Publishing who did take it on and were willing to do a book like this uh, on this kind of material and did not edit out the truth at all, which was always the fear. Oh, you know, this is going to be too heavy. This is too slanted this way or whatever we think. They never did. And uh, the editors there, Sierra Hahn and Alan Granowitz, they worked tirelessly with us as a collaboration, all of us. Uh, Attica is all of us. And uh, including Pearl and including Carlos, who, who helped me with the book. Um, and that's what got it over the finish line, an incredible, incredible team effort.
by a little ragtag army, just like the Attica brothers were. No weapons, just us. And here it is. OK, so I'm going to open this up for audience participation. I would be, I think the word is remiss, if I didn't reference one more person. And that is Akhil Al-Jundi, yes. who's also one of the Attica brothers. And he's actually also the guy who introduced me to Big Black maybe a couple decades ago now. <laughs> by the way, Danny, Danny actually, because Akhil had passed away by the time of the um, award for the, ver of the, of the settlement, which was horribly low considering the victories that we had won, but Akhil had already passed away, and Danny, uh, went and testified on Akhil's behalf for his family so that they could get uh, their share of the settlement money for Akhil al -Jindi. And he was somebody who came to our house for holidays and all events. Uh, and just thank you for mentioning that. Yeah. yeah. And I just want to add, Akhil was also one of the very few people who came together to found the October 22nd National Day of Protest to Stop Police Brutality, Repression, and the Criminalization of a Generation back in 1996 at a point when most of the activists around police brutality were telling me there was no need for any nationwide effort against police brutality. It should be fought locally because that's where the brutality happens. And we were like, there's a nationwide epidemic of this shit. And Akil was one of the very few people, I think Pam Africa was involved from the Move family, uh, a guy from the West Coast in the National Warriors, but Jim Lafferty, uh, the Four Winds student movement, I can't remember the guy's name, and somebody from Food Not Bombs, Keith McHenry. That's what we were able to get together. We kicked it off with that. So let's open it up now with that. Any comments, questions? Yeah, he's the only one so far. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a comment to make, but I'd like to make that later. I just, um, first of all, this is very moving and really important, especially in this time. But the one question I just have, um, well, it's just a request. If Maybe you could describe a, a, the, for those who don't know or those watching the video, how the uprising and rebellion actually happened and what was involved in that. I'll, I'll give a little and I'm sure Dan will supplement. So, so you know, George Jackson, a very famous prison author at the time, uh, was killed in uh, San Quentin prison uh, under very suspicious circumstances. Uh, and the brothers at Attica, who were very used to uh, the administration taking beatings, reprisals, assassinations, uh, you know, uh, extraordinary measures to punish people and cruelty. Truly, truly believe, you know, truly, you know, uh, were very suspicious of the circumstances. Of course, we all know that Angela Davis uh, then uh, was underground in that situation. Um, and Angela Davis also testified on behalf of the brothers and was a very good friend of Big Black's and testified against Nelson Rockefeller. Big Black went and testified against the confirmation of uh, Nelson Rockefeller to be vice president uh, when he was appointed vice president after Attica. Angela Davis and Big Black went to Washington, D.C. and testified against him. The Brothers, because of very humane uh, requests, they ate. The, they were fed pork every day. Muslims don't eat pork, so they couldn't get nutrition. You were given one shower a week in Attica, one shower a week. Now you might think that they all went into some clubhouse, like you know, a gym, and and showered. They didn't. They were given one bucket of water to wash, 
one bucket of water to rinse once a week. Football players, athletes, big men, they were given one roll of to toilet paper a month. You ran out, you had to make deals. That's how it was. So they had made a very humane list of demands, requests, not demands, requests really at that point, to negotiate. They had already begun organizing. Brothers from the different groups, like I said, the Young Lords, the Black Panthers, the Muslims, had all begun collaborating on this list. Pay us minimum wage. They were making 37 cents an hour doing slave labor. They called it the warden's plantation. Big Black had to do the personal laundry of the warden. So they called it the warden's plantation because, again, they used, they used the vocabulary of slave rebellion. They saw that. They saw that they were a continuation of that. And they had the language of mass incarceration back then, which was, I'll, I'll let Danny tell the story, but at that time, I believe there was uh, a dispute between sure you talk two, into the mic. a dispute between two inmates, and one of them went into solitary, and this really became more than tolerable for the brothers. And what happens on September nine? is that there is a large number of brothers who are marching from the mess hall along a corridor. And for some reason, the gate gives. And the, the, they got <laughs> the, the, the yard is open to them all. And they go around and uh, tell other brothers to come out from wherever they are, their cells, where they're working, and we're going to mass together in D yard and we're going to make demands for humane conditions and that's what they did that's how they get into the yard that's how the brothers form this committee of the most uh, involved brothers on one side of the table and then the next day comes a, com a commissioner of corrections everything is written out as to what they want the other thing that aids their position, and which they hoped would peacefully resolve the situation, is the formation of people from the outside, selected by the brothers, called the observers. They came to Attica, 30 of them came to Attica, uh, including the most famous was William Kunzler. But you also had Tom Wicker, who was the associate editor of the New York Times. You had Herman Badillo, who was a congressperson at that time. Clarence you had Jones. Arthur O'Eve, yeah. who was the head of the state assembly in, in New York. And you, had all, and you had clergy, and you had press. And there were 30 of them, and they were there for the purposes of resolving this thing peacefully, and they couldn't. And they couldn't. And Tom Wicker writes a book about his experience at Attica called The Time to Die. And that was from a statement that Herman Badillo made to, to, um, to Wicker when the gas was thrown at them from the helicopter. And Badillo says to, um, uh, Badillo says to Wicker, what was the hurry, what was the rush, there's always a time to die. And so it didn't matter that these observers were there. It didn't matter that these observers had sufficient prestige to get in touch with Rockefeller and to tell Rockefeller, you have to come to Attica. You can resolve this. You need to come. Rockefeller says, I'm not coming. And he wasn't going to come because it wasn't in his political interest to come. His political interest was to order a massacre. And as Jared said, he does become vice president of the United States. As an aside, 
It's the first time and only time in the history of the United States that there's an unelected president and an unelected vice president. Wow. Gerald Ford is not elected. He takes, he was Nixon's vice president when Nixon resigns and Rockefeller is appointed. So you had that kind of uh, historic circumstance at that time also. And, and I'll add too that Big Black was in the laundry room working when he smelled the smoke and things like that and could tell something was going on. And he was told by prisoners that, you know, uh, you know it was chaos at the beginning, of course, because nobody could imagine this whole situation taking place. He actually runs into the rebellion. He makes the decision. He could have left. He was in a place where prisoners were coming through to walk out and escape what was going on and other guards. But he had actually heard one of his friends that was a guard was injured. And Big Black makes the decision to step out and secure his safety and secure his release. And that guard says to him, as Big Black walks him to the, the, to the gate through what they call the DMZ, the demilitarized zone or the dead man zone. You can choose whichever euphemism. And he brings Tony to, uh, to safety with all the, all the other injured guards and prisoners that were having medical issues. And Tony looks at Big Black and says, you know, come with me, come with me. And Big Black says, I can't, I have a job to do. Mm. So that's the kind of guy he was. And he was chosen, Herbert X. Blyden, who was one of the leaders of the rebellion, we should also mention, Herbert X. Blyden called Big Black up and said, everybody here respects you. Everybody here respects you. Will you be our chief of security? even the guards like you. And that's why he was chosen. And then that ends up being the reason he's singled out for such torture. OK, any other comments, questions? <laughs> Unless it's the Grateful Dead Zone. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I'm Jared's brother, Chris, uh, and Danny is my stepfather. And Danny, this is really for you. Um, can you talk a little bit about your struggles, your inspiration for taking on the machinery of, let's say, the state and the government over such a long period of time for a legal battle, pulling together the resources that you have to take that on. Um, how, do you, how did you manage that? And what do you think of the sacrifice and what that has meant to your life personally? Well, and, and, and also, I would say thank you for, for doing that <laughs> and being a, an inspiration to your family and to your kids and to all the people that know you. I'm glad you feel that way. That's, <laughs> that's very important, obviously. Um, and I have the support of family. I mean, the, the fundamental answer to this is the support of family. Chris and Jared and Amy my wife, Joan, and my parents. Sam Myers was a towering figure in the struggle in New York for justice. He was a union president of the United Auto Workers, and he actually hired prisoners. Um, the Auburn Six gets hired by Sam. Akil and Black are extremely close. And so I have all this wonderful support to do the work. I'm also not alone. There are five of us that represent the Attica brothers in this class action lawsuit styled Akil al-Jundi against Rockefeller. 
It was on behalf of the 1,281 prisoners. We wanted the case, of course, to be here in federal court in Manhattan. It was not allowed. It was sent, the case, to the federal court in Buffalo, and we got screwed royally by an awful judge. And a judge that didn't allow a trial, a liability trial, for 17 years. 17 years. It's unheard of. Federal court is, is fast. You go into federal court because you want a rapid disposition. 17 years to get a liability trial. And so we were all activist lawyers. We're all National Lawyers Guild lawyers. Uh, wonderful uh, people, obviously, who were willing to take on this kind of case without any real, none of us had any money. You know, we were all working class people, but we had family that helped us, and that was enough for us to, to be able to do it. I don't remember how. We worked. Uh, during those 17 years, we worked. I was, all of us were lawyering. We made some money. Um, that was obviously necessary in order to do the Attica case. Um, but we developed these relationships and friendships with uh, Akhil Al-Jundi, he's beyond great, and Big Black, and Roger Champion, and Herbert X. Blyden, and Richard X. Clark, and all of these leaders, plus those who carried, who, who were part of the Young Lords and the Black Panthers, you know, they had, we, we had relationships with those groups from the outside. Um, I, I, you know, I think that that's how we did it. We could not continue after the Second Circuit Court of Appeals threw out all our verdicts, every one. All those years, 25 years of litigation, that also is unheard of. No appellate court throws out jury verdicts that are that old. They would say it's harmless error, if, you know. Um, but no, they threw it out. And we had to settle because there was no way under the way this court then ruled that we could do individual, 1,281 individual cases. You know, they, they threw out the class status. The class status allowed us to litigate one for all and all for one. What was going to happen if we kept the case was that we'd have to try 1,281 cases, people. Couldn't happen. We settled, um, and that ended the Attica legal issues. Obviously, Attica cannot end. We just went through a rather uh, a lengthy 50th commemoration. I don't know if anybody here saw some of the uh, lifespan and other things of the two nights. Um, that's 50. It felt as fresh as last week. And there'll be more. There'll be 60. It'll never end, and it may very well represent some other kinds of acts and actions as, as the years go on. Um, but I'll tell you, 50 years can go quickly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't believe I'm talking about something I did 50 years ago. That's the way it went. <clears throat> Good evening, gentlemen. Um, my name is Isaiah. Um, I am 19 years old. And my question for you, for all of you actually is, will you, do you think there will be another uh, big black or person of that significance come again or come around? And how do you feel about the society that we live in today? Mm. Well, I, I, I will answer that, that obviously uh, with George Floyd and the type of person he was and what, you know, really reminded me a lot of what L.D. Barkley was all about that he, a person that was assassinated in, in the most brutal way who engendered such humanity in his life that uh, was able to move a country 
in the midst of a lockdown to look at the issue of mass incarceration and police brutality in a way that this country, even with Attica, and I will say that, that Attica did at the time, and Attica actually, at the time, promoted an, an incredible attempt at change because people realized how unjust this was. Um, and Harlem, one of the epicenters uh, of marches, of protests, uh, they marched through the streets with, with coffins uh, to symbolically carry the brothers through the streets that had been murdered. And in fact, that's where Pearl Battle, her name was at the time, was watching the protest and went out with all of her family. And that's where she was introduced to Attica and ultimately then met Big Black and became his, his North Star. I say it in the book, in the, in the uh, dedication. And Pearl, in fact, I will add again, was the one that always said, you can't give this up. You cannot give this up. You have to, you have to try and see this through. And uh, without Pearl, I don't think Big Black would have been able to maintain his humanity the way he did. Um, and I do believe some of them will come again. I do. You know, Malcolm came. Uh, you know, Big Black came. L.D. Barkley came. George Jackson came. Angela Davis came. Uh, Sada Shakur came. You know, they will come again. It doesn't feel that way because he was so towering of a figure for us and for everybody that knew him. But someone will come again. Someone will come again. Okay, I guess I'd like to start with your last point about what do you think about this society? I mean, and look, this is a society, it's a capitalist imperialist society in a capitalist imperialist world, and it works based upon ruthlessly exploiting and savagely oppressing the majority of people. It's no damn good and it's got to be gotten rid of in the only way that's really possible and that's through revolution. And this is an important time because right now there's a vulnerability being brought about by the vicious fight at the top. And you see all the horrible things that the fascists in the Republican Party and Donald Trump are doing right now. Well, that's their plan for keeping the system in effect. The opposition from the Democrats is their plan to keep the system in effect, not to serve the interest of the people. That poses the need for revolution, but it also creates openings for it because it's a time when the factors that you need for a revolution could be brought into being. And again, I've mentioned this before, but maybe you weren't here. This piece by Bob Avakian, this is a rare time when revolution becomes possible. Why this is so? and how to seize on this rare opportunity. This is something that people need to check out, get into, talk with us about here at Revolution Books. Talk to the Revolution Club, which operates out of here. I believe there's gonna be an open house at Revolution Books this weekend. Can someone give me Saturday the Saturday from three to five. Okay, Saturday from three to five, there's gonna be an open house here at Revolution Books come back, sit down with us, talk about this, take this material and read it, bring some of your friends with you, and let's get into it because something needs to be done. And then that takes me to the thing of will there be another Big Black? And we should actually look at it because on one level, Big Black wasn't Big Black. Akhil Aljundi wasn't Akhil Aljundi. L.D. Barkley wasn't L.D. Barkley until the situation presented itself where there was a challenge to stand up against injustice and they responded to that challenge. You know, the same thing with uh, Fannie Lou Hamer. Many, many more people. Challenges you. came. Yeah. Well, I was going to come towards that. I was going to come towards that. Challenges were presented to people. I mean, with me personally, it was a challenge. You're going to go to Vietnam and kill 
Vietnamese people for this system that wants to drown their revolution in blood. And I said, hell no, I'm not. L.D. Barclay, Big Black, the other Attica brothers respond to that challenge by standing up. My phone is tripping. <laughs> OK, take the sound down, man. You can get back to whoever it is or whatever it is. Hey, my phone just started doing that. OK. No, but see, those challenges are out there, and people need to stand up and meet them. And that's where Big Black came from. That's where Fannie Lou Hamer came from. That's where the rest of Malcolm X came from. Well, that's where all those people that we look up to, that's where they came from. They have to be connected with something else, though. We need to have leadership to make a revolution. I know a lot of folks be saying, oh, no, no, we don't need no leaders. We don't need no leaders. Well, actually, you do, because making revolution is a very complex thing. And that's why it's very important not only that people stand up, but that people develop an understanding of why are we facing these problems. Where do they come from, and what do we need to do about it? And a very important thing that we have right now is Bob Avakian, the leader of the movement for an actual revolution in this country, who has developed a new framework for human emancipation, the new communism, who's authored a constitution for a future socialist republic in North America that gives you a vision of the kind of society we could bring into being through revolution and has spoken on how you can make a revolution. And they're, talk to me about that afterwards, because you need to check this out. But that's the combination that we got to get. We got to get people standing up and saying hell no to this shit. And we got to connect that with the revolutionary understanding that can get us out of it. Because there's going to be a lot of horrors coming down, and people need to stand up against them. And that's where the fighters who can inspire people are going to come forward. And I'm a revolutionary leader myself. I'm going to be working to hook them up with the understanding that can lead us out of this shit once and for all. That's what I wanted to say on that. I, I, I would only, and I would only add that to remember, and what I think Big Black and uh, Akil and Herbert X and Richard X all, and Carlos Roche and uh, L.D. Barkley and all the things that these people, and, and Sister Angela, of course, uh, would tell you is that, uh, you know, how we treat the most vulnerable in society really is the mark of our society. And these are not people to be thrown away. These are not people to be discounted and forgotten about. That our brothers and sisters uh, that are in prison and are suffering under this system are not to be forgotten by us. And one of the things that Danny had brought into our lives in the 70s was, a, was, was to be a part of a vibrant prisoner rights movement. And, you know, with the advent of, again, further capitalism shows like cops or in jail and da da da. You know, people are able to dehumanize, uh, even in their minds, separate these people in prison. And these are our brothers, these are our sisters, and uh, this country is ultimately in a death spiral with mass incarceration because they saw mass incarceration as the extension of slavery, lynching, Jim Crow segregation and and they were absolutely right and and we always have to remember that these people are not to be thrown away you know and we are we are we give we say like uh, sister Angela Davis said at the committee the other night we are abolitionists we are abolitionists and we're proud of it and uh, we have to end this death spiral with mass incarceration that has taken so much from all of us, honestly, whether we know it or not. Okay, I think there was one more hand. Was that you up front? Right here. Is there one back there? Right here. This is one I saw. Um, I just want, th this is a inspiring and moving and very important program. Mm -hmm. I haven't read the book yet. We all should read it. This is partly an answer to what you just said. This history can't be erased. 
because it was courageous, important, and inspired millions. That's one reason why people need to know about it. People need to know about it because we're living in a moment, like Carl said, of tremendous horrors for humanity, and too many people are turning inwards and turning away, including many people who a year ago were doing the right thing. To put it all on the line, not just in a single moment, to put it, can you turn this volume up, please? Could, to put it all on the line in this moment is extremely important. And I think especially also the example of people uniting together. We have a situation where people are murdering each other who live on different blocks because they're in different sets while the system is creating the conditions where they can't even s survive. Those people need to come together. And you can magnify that a million different times. I have a few announcements just to make for related and really important programs that are coming up here at Revolution Books. But also what the brother said, will we have people like this come forward again? In the current situation, I don't know if we can. With cancel culture and all the woke lunacy that's going on right now, people who make mistakes in their past, I understand Big Black wasn't in there for so much. People like Carl Dix were in there for no reason at all other than speaking out. But anybody who has a mistake in their past is given a public death sentence basically for the rest of their lives. If Malcolm X came forward in this moment right now, he wouldn't, because of the things he did in his youth, he wouldn't be allowed to become Malcolm X. So I think that's something we all have to come to terms with. These are the events, they're important. Once, here, I'm making announcements for Revolution Books, right here. On Saturday, September 25th, free all of Iran's political prisoners. An afternoon of solidarity and resistance. Those are our brothers and sisters, and you can come and learn about the struggle of thousands of political prisoners in Iran who are suffering similar kind of treatment that Big Black was described that Big Black went through. That program will feature via streaming people from Iran and other parts of the world who are not able to come here. So please come on September 25th. On Wednesday, September 29th, right here at 7 p.m., for the 60th anniversary of Franz Fanon's The Wretched of the Earth, featuring Cornell West, we'll be de debuting a new printing of that book with a new introduction by Cornell West. And Cornell West and Andy Z, spokesperson of this store, will be dialoguing about that book and the impact. And then on Saturday, October 2nd, new fiction from the African diaspora with Mukuma Wa Gugi and Wakjiko Wa Gugi. And they are, um, their family's originally from Kenya. So I hope you guys, you can pick this up in the back. And these are really important programs. And thanks so much. I hope you guys can do something like this again in a few months. And, or at least we get the video out to a lot of people and the book. Okay. Well, I just have one last thing to say. I was actually going to announce a few of those oh, yeah. Yeah, but I guess I don't have to I'm now. Sorry. But on the one on September 29th, Wretched of the Earth was a book for a lot of people in my generation. It was kind of like you had to read it, and if you hadn't read it, you tried to front like you had read it because you didn't want people to know that you was behind the times. No, but this is a book that people in the Black Panther Party talked about in terms of turning them on and guiding them towards and into revolution. And it was a seminal work for that time. And here, 60 years later, it's being reissued. It's also popping up in just the popular culture. You'll be watching a TV series, and one of the characters will be reading Re Wretched of the Earth. Well, we need to get back into that because we need a revolution and revolutionary spirit and revolutionary thinking today. But we also need to critically get into it and say, well, what of it is still relevant? What's dated? How, what new approach to this is required? So I really recommend that you come and be there for this because Cornell has written uh, 
an introductory essay for this new edition. He's going to talk about that, and then he and Andy are going to go back and forth on what Fanon represented then and now, how to understand some of the concepts that he spoke to. So I really recommend you do that, and then come back for the one on, set, what's it, October 2nd, Saturday? Yes, 3 o'clock. 3 o'clock, because these are African authors who are going to be speaking about African literature throughout the world, because Africans are throughout the world right now, and there's a lot of important things developing in that literature. People need to, and, and this is the store for it to happen in, because like I said, it is a store with books about the world and books for a new world. Any last words from you guys? I want to thank Brother Carl and Brother Smitty in the back for, for uh, engaging me at Opus 40 and, and bringing us here. This is, uh, like I said, this was the epicenter of resistance after Attica, Harlem, uh, will always be. And, uh, and, and we are honored to be here, and I thank you greatly. Um, I, I'd like to second what Jared said and add and add that um, the more we realize what the reality is locally and nationally, the greater the opportunity we have to make change. And Jared or Carl asked, uh, how did you become involved in something 50 years ago that was so monumental? The answer is, is that I s made baby steps in response to that demand. And as we went on, we got stronger and stronger and stronger and more resolved. And so we all should see ourselves at whatever stages of development it is important to realize that there's a future ahead, especially when it's a radical future. <laughs>